Well, hello and welcome to another Beneath the Surface chat. I'm here with Eric Coffin of the Hard Rock Analyst. Um, my name's Gwen Preston. I'm um, to introduce myself since uh, I'm sitting here instead of Scott. Um, I am a journalist who's been writing about the mining sector for quite some time and I'm just launching my own newsletter. Um, uh, along similar lines of what Eric has been doing so well for so many years and uh, that will be called Resource Maven um, and as part of that publication I've developed an association with the team here at Beneath the Surface and so that's why Eric and I are here to have a chat about commodities, um, the, the cycle in the resource sector where it might be and some opportunities that we're looking at. So starting maybe with big picture Let's talk about the world and what's going on economically. I mean, I what I've been reading about in the last few days, certainly Europe has caught my eye a lot. I know um, expectations were very low for Europe um, EU economic performance this year. And in the last quarter, things have come in pretty dismally below expectations. So set the bar low and they failed to even meet that. And I think people around here often don't think of Europe as being that important to the global economy, but it is. Right? It's, it's essentially, in, in terms of size of economic output, it's essentially the same as the U.S. I mean, the EU, in terms of overall output, is basically the same size as the states, and I don't think anyone would argue the U.S. isn't important to the global economy and, and, and can swing it itself. And, and you're right, I mean, no one no one expected Europe to have a lot of impact this year, but they were expecting to at least sort of limp along. Mm -hmm. And it's starting. GDP or yeah, I mean, we're not so sure. It's yeah. starting to look like they won't even manage that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Italy's gone back into recession, but you know, <laughs> it's Italy. Um, Germany was a bit of a surprise. I mean, how yeah. quickly, how quickly sentiment turned negative in Germany, and how quickly exports turned negative. And it, it appears to mainly be about the Ukraine. I mean, they do have they do have big export markets, not just in Russia, but just the Eastern Bloc countries, what used to be the Eastern Bloc countries, because they're obviously all neighbors of Germany. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like that's like the the, the floors just come right out from under that by the looks of it. Yeah, and that's that that socio political situation has had some interesting impact. Certainly, it's it's been part of the Germany story for sure. It's I guess been part of the gold story, but gold continued to trend down for many many weeks as tensions in Ukraine escalated, and it's only in the last little bit that gold has gone back up. So gold's response to that situation has been a little bit perplexing. Yeah, it hasn't really. I mean, in, in a sense, I'm 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 almost glad to see it because I'm never a fan of geopolitical spikes. Right. Because they are spikes. Um, it, it's unsustainable. A, yeah, yeah, it's generally a very bad idea to try to chase those anyway. It it seemed like the situation really didn't get taken seriously, unfortunately, until the jetliner was shot down. That seemed to be the the tipping point for the whole thing. Uh, I, I, it, it's looking a little more like it might get wrapped up now in the sense that the government of the Ukraine has gotten very serious about this and mm -hmm. they seem to be winning <laughs> to the extent anybody wins one of these things. Yeah. But it looks, it does look like there's going to be some reper repercussions in the sense that some of the, I think some of the sanctions are probably going to be here for a while. It sounds, it sounds like we have entered a, a new period of jousting between Russia and, and the West in particular, which is unfortunate, but it's not a big surprise. I mean, I think a lot of people saw that coming. Absolutely. And whether just between Russia and the West or the entire East versus West, there's lots of developments in China in terms of gold imports to China now bypassing Hong Kong and energy or commodity deals in the East being done not in U.S. dollars. So all of those things sort of add up to a new to a shift in that balance. You know, I think we'd all like to see, you know, gold, for instance, trading better, but when you look at the number of disappointments, I, I would call them, you know, if you go back six months and every, people in the gold market were expecting, you know, this positive factor, that positive right. factor, the other positive factor, really none of them have shown up. And yet, you know, gold's off slightly, but it's really trading fairly well. And it's even 10% this year type thing. Well, and, and look at the gold, the, ec the gold equity indices are, I'm, I'm really impressed at how well they're trading. Mm. I mean, I was looking at it this morning before I went downtown for meetings, and both the GDX and the, and the Canadian version, the, the, the TSE Gold Index, they're slightly, slightly off hmm. where they were in March when gold was bouncing off 1380. 
and I mean slightly, like half a percent, maybe below that. I mean, and they've had big climb in the last three, four weeks. They're up. Toronto, the Toronto Gold Index is up 30 percent in the last three weeks. Also, a little bit perplexing is copper. It seems to have been holding its ground pretty well, still up in the 315 range, yeah. um, which doesn't make a lot of sense. The market has moved into surplus, and there's huge supply coming online in the next two years for sure. Um, so I certainly have expected copper to go down. I don't know if you have any ideas about why it's it's maintaining its its level. I think I've, I've been ex as skeptical as you when it comes to copper. I mean, there's some copper deals I follow that I like, but the metal itself, my expectations were, I, th I thought we would see, you know, 275 before we saw 330 again. Right. Like, a, and I wouldn't have been that shocked if it even went lower than that because we have gone well into surplus. If you look at the LME inventories, they're dropping like a rock and have been for mm. four or five months. And that's a real head scratcher for me. I'm not yeah. sure where that's going. Because if you look at the output in China, at least the, the official numbers, and you look at the amount, they seem to be trying to basically reel back some of the infrastructure and construction spending. Where's that going? Like, who's using this stuff? Like, it's amazing because it's not even, the drawdown is much more rapid than it was you know, you go back to like 2008 when the copper price was going right. crazy because everyone was freaking out because the LM inventories are falling off a cliff. Yeah. They probably dropped faster this year, but I don't know where, I don't know what the other side of that trade is. I don't know who's got that. Interesting, yeah. Now that copper will certainly be an interesting one to watch in the next right. little bit. Um, also interesting is zinc. We're at a three year high or just off of a three year high in zinc. Um, I think simply. My perspective is simply because of that climb, there's people who are starting to call for a correction, but the market still says deficit for a couple years, um, like the fundamentals still look good. So aside from, you know, emotional reactions to, yeah. to spikes, um, it looks like zinc still has room to run yeah. or at least maintain. Well, maintain, but I, I suspect before it's said and done, we'll see, we will actually see a, a strong run. The inventories right now are, kind of middling, they're not, they're not low yet, they're, they're, mm -hmm. you're still looking at five, six 600,000 tons, which is reasonably high for zinc, but I think the important part of the story is that it's come out, it's basically been cut in half in the last year. Right. There's really, unlike copper, there's, there's really nothing large at all coming on stream in the zinc market for, for, I don't know how long, years to come. No one's really building a big zinc mine, nobody's even close to completing permitting on a big zinc mine. Right, there's so a few that, small ones here and there. Yeah, and China's got, China's got all kinds of small mines, but there's, they're cracking down so hard on pollution over there, and I do think they're dead serious about it. Mm -hmm. I don't see them being able to flip a switch either, so I think it's pretty much baked in the cake that we're going to see. I don't know whether it's going to be three months from now, nine months from now. I think we're going to wake up one day and you're going to see zinc go from, you know, buck, buck ten to buck 50, buck 60, it'll happen fairly fast once it starts. There you go. Because once traders get on that, it's not a big market. I mean, yeah, it's easy to move. all you need is three hedge funds and yeah, off you go. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, it's good to have a metal that um, we have <laughs> a positive outlook on. We found one. Um, and I think um, zinc is a story that you, you also have a company that you yeah. are interested in that's, that's primary interest there is zinc, so what do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I just came back from uh, visiting Constantine Metals Palmer Project in Alaska. I, I've followed them for several years and mm -hmm. I've always liked that project. It always felt like one that was going to get across the finish line. I was there in 2009 as well before, you know, yeah. economic difficulties derailed so many juniors and same, same concept. And, you know, base metals are Base metals are always a tougher sell than gold. I mean, they're always harder to raise money for. These guys have certainly had their trials and tribulations market-wise, but they really turned the corner last year. They 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 did a very strong deal with Doha Mining, um, an incredibly strong deal, really. Twenty-two million in spending for Doha to earn forty-nine percent. These guys keep operatorship all the way through. They've put that money to good use. Done some early-stage metallurgy. Right now, they're drilling a large conductive plate. Um, they already have. The, la the last resource number is four years old. That was four and a half million tons. They're probably more like six now. But this conductive plate, they just put the first hole out, out of. If they can do even a handful of 100 meter step outs to look anything like that, uh, you know, they get to eight or 10 million tons. And I think eight's 
probably a magic number in terms of in terms of saying yes, we're going to start moving to pre-feasibility feasibility. feasibility. Okay. Uh, DOA still has to spend 12 million after this year's program. Mm -hmm. um, some of which I think will be. I mean, really, you go up on that property, and if there's if there's was ever a property where you say to yourself, these guys need an add it. <laughs> that that property, they need an add it. I mean, it's a steep, yeah. steep property, yeah. right? The I drill mean, no. the drill platforms are built out of the side of cliffs. It's yeah. Not for the fan of heart, no. I can tell you. <laughs> Definitely not. But it's it's a great project. I mean, it's 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 fant and it's it's a good area. I mean, it seems. I mean, I talked to a few people in Haines, Alaska, which is the closest place, yeah. and they're they're very supportive of it. I mean, most of the people in Haines are in logging, forestry, placer. Like, yes, they get a few cruise ships, but it's not. And yes, there's big parks there, but this is working forest. You can see there's been a lot of both logging and plaster all around these guys, mm -hmm. so I, I don't think they're going to run into a lot of trouble with the locals. And how do you feel about the stock? I mean, when I've talked to people about Constantine, they're like, well, they gave up half the project, so then people worry about how much potential there is left in the stock. What's your response to that? If you look at, I mean, the, one of the things I like about certainly the better holes they're generating, they're, they're coming in around 200, 225 gross metal value, which is pretty high for a VMS. Uh, if you look at if you look at things in the belt, the belt that they're in, uh, probably the best known, well, the best known mi mine, non-mine in the belt is Windy Craggy, which had a park dropped on top of it. But in the other direction is Greens Creek. Uh, Both amazing. Yeah, and Heckler Heckler took out what 80, 70 percent of that for 750 million. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a 20. Granted, that's a 25 million ton deposit. Is there room for? For probably 25 million tons, well, not this year, but is there ultimately? Yeah, I mean, you know, we looked at a lot of showings mm -hmm. all around the main zone, you know, two, three, four, five, six kilometers away that, that they've really never been touched. I mean, there's, there's a lot of target there. And that's the way VMS systems work, too. Yeah. Lenses I mean, folded in that. stratigraphies, yeah. and you never just see one. Yeah, it's always, they're always camps. Yeah. And Dora actually is a very good. You know, although they they don't they clearly don't want to be operators anymore. They don't want to be the ones running mines. Mm -hmm. Doha actually started out in the Kuroko camp in Japan, is where they got their start 120 years ago. Probably probably the world's most famous VMS camp, and it was the same way. A couple of small deposits were found there, but by the time they were done, well, it's a hundred million ton in camp. That's just how VMS is. There's never only one. There's always tons of them, scores of them. Yeah, I think that's a really exciting zinc story, for sure. I've been following them as well. Um, I mean, if, if gold's another metal that is moving up right now, and you know, I, I think there's reasonable confidence it's not about to fall off a cliff. Well, and it seems to be getting more... <laughs> gold companies seem to be attracting more money anyway, yeah. so it's, it, it feels like things are getting a little easier. I don't know if it's that balance between being at the bottom of a cycle and wanting safe haven and thinking of gold, but then also wanting opportunity. I don't know. People tie those together, yeah. but gold is certainly getting more attention. I think one of the stories I've noticed out there that's been um, definitely attracting attention is Rock Haven. Mm -hmm. So they're, a, um, they're an Archer Cathro Strategic Metals Associated company. So Strategic Metals actually owns 30% of Rock Haven, um, but it's an epithermal gold system that's in a very accessible part of the Yukon, so sort of southeastern, not in the corner, but just southeastern in general. Road accessible, um, uh, great management because it comes from that group of highly proficient geologists who have just reams of experience in the Yukon for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, no argument there. Um, and it's a project that it had, you know, a look here and a look there, but never sort of a comprehensive look. And no one had quite moved to the sweet spot. And that's what Rock Haven's been able to do over the past few years. They started drilling down where there had been some initial interest, and then. Really, in 2012, they made some big step outs along structure, and they just kept hitting, and they kept hitting these. And it's a it's a narrow um, uh, struct vein structure. You're talking two to four meters your um, true width of your intercepts, but you're also talking definitely double digits grams per ton gold. They're all they've been putting out things that are 26 grams gold and 40 grams silver per ton. So there's some very strong intercepts coming out. Um, and now they've moved up to that sweet spot and they're focusing in on two parts of it where they're going to establish a resource by the end of the year, for sure. Um, and uh, one's called Klaza and one's called BRX. And 
it looks really good. They have three drills turning right now, which anywhere in the world for a junior resource company is pretty notable yeah. for sure. Um, originally planning on doing 12,000 meters for $4 million and just recently a bunch of warrants were exercised, primarily by strategic and yeah. those who are associated with strategic. Um, put some more money in the till, so now they're going to do 21,000 meters. Um, and I think that resource is going to surprise the market. Well, and I, you know, I, I think the market tends to with a couple of exceptions, and maybe those exceptions, you know, companies like Roxco, but maybe that those exceptions start changing perception because certainly up to now, you know, if you look at the bad times in the sector and you look at the companies that have survived those times well and, and generally come out of them gobbling up the rest of the sector, almost invariably it was companies working on high-grade underground That's mines. Small, high grade and gold, for some reason everyone's mines. forgotten that. Yeah, and they, had, they had some flexibility in there. They could close down stopes. They could focus on really good stopes. They could just use it to generate money to get through the hard times. Yeah. Um, and the economics of those small underground operations can be very compelling. Yeah, even, I mean, the nice thing with margin is it, it gives, you know, margin gives you options. Um, as as, uh, as my, my brother used to say, you can't stope an open pit. And... and the thing is, those those were the only thing you could get anyone to care about for a decade or more. Yeah. But if you're on top of the Andes mining a gram per ton, and your cash cost is eleven hundred dollars and gold drops to a thousand dollars, you're done. Like mm -hmm. there, there is no out. You're you're finished. If you're mining twelve grams on fourteen different stopes underground, you don't really want to be high grading. I mean. It's, Sure. But you can. But you can. Exactly. It can keep you alive, and when times are good, you can make a. L the margins can be very high in a good underground mine. So, yeah. And it's a great, you know, like you said, it's a great group of guys. Technically, I mean, the managing director of Archer Cathro is who's a friend of mine. I know because he phoned me two weeks ago. <laughs> it's the second biggest shareholder, and he owns a yes. lot. And more now. As and more now, <laughs> yes. And he's not a, you know, he's not a crazy guy, but he's certainly. They've run out of Kool-Aid by the looks of it. Yeah. He, he definitely drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> well, he's a, a believer. Lot. He exercised his warrants at well above market, so he yeah. clearly believes that the stock has room to move from. Yeah, its and he's not—he's not crazy as far as I can tell. He seems pretty, 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 <laughs> pretty logical to me, and he's—he's he's a fairly hard nosed guy, and they—they they know the economics. But mm -hmm. I think, like you said, it, it seems—it feels like this year was a year where they—they they can really see it. Mm -hmm. The market doesn't seem to—the market isn't seeing it yet, but the, the people closest to the project. They're genuinely extremely I was just positive. there, and they're very positive about it. I think part of the market problem was they drilled for two years, and then they spent last year not drilling at all. They were only right. trenching to try and follow the structure on surface because their step-outs had been so big, they weren't sure that it was the same structure still. Right. So I think maybe the market took that as a pullback or it's uncertainty or what, whatever it might have been. Yeah. Now they're back drilling and because now, now they know that these things are definitely continuous structures. And it's this interesting kind of epithermal as well that generally only, at least this is the new theory, that that we've generally only seen in Colombia, this carbonate-based metal mm -hmm. epithermal deposit, where the main thing is, it's a general, it's the same as most epithermals, but the point is that it can have very, very long vertical continuity, like a kilometer yeah. of continuity. So even if you're narrow, if you've got the zones they're looking at right now, two and a half kilometers long, two and a half kilometers long, if you're talking about a kilometer of depth, I mean, that's a considerable tonnage right Yeah, there. I mean, Porgera is one of those, Bertica is one of those, mm -hmm. and it is, I, I think if you looked at, and it would be the completely reasonable assumption in that part of the world, somebody showed you a set of assets like that, you'd, you'd assume that it was, in fact, an epithermal, and, and generally, epithermal deposits, you're, you're lucky if you can get, say, 300 meters exactly. of vertical extent in the Bonanza zone, and you're not even going to get that most of the time. It'll be like 200. Yeah. So it's it's not hard to see why people would look at that and go, well, you know, what's the best it can be? Like half a million ounces, maybe? Who cares? But if you start thinking in terms of six, eight hundred meters, a thousand yeah. meters, that's a whole different story. I know they're keen to take a big step back and go really deep. It's just a very expensive hole to drill. So yeah. they're focusing on the resource and for I now. I, I assume they've got the rigs to do that. I asked Doug, and he was he didn't. He didn't really answer because I did. I asked him that too. It was like, are you guys going to just? I mean, if if you guys are that convinced of that theory, you're going to just kind of go for it and drill a thousand meter hole or something. Yeah, maybe next year. Yeah. Let's let them establish a resource first. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that was my gold story. Do you have a gold story that you wanted to mention, or? Yeah. I mean, 
Oh, I think Every I know which one you might. Oh, yeah, you, <laughs> no, you do. And so do you probably. And, and I will preface it with my usual, this is, not, this is not an objective comment, and I don't read it in the newsletter because I own a ton. Uh, precipitate, which is near and dear to me, uh, they are now drilling on the Wanda Herrera project, yes. the Ginger Ridge zone down in, down in the uh, Dominican Republic. I was just and chatting with Jeff on my way here, and he was giving me the update, and he seems pretty excited. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 when you look at the trenches that they did at surface, and that's really what got it started, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's frankly fairly unexciting looking stuff. It doesn't, the trenches don't really look like much of anything. Okay. It's just the nature of that stuff in that part of the world. Okay. Well, plus it's oxidized. Uh, oxidized stuff never looks like much. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, I don't think it would be like, you know, I, I don't think it would be like Klaza where it would kind of jump out at you. It's, it won't yeah. be that sort of thing. So obviously they're just, they'll have to drill the holes and get, and get them back, but it's, it's such a nice coherent target, small market cap and supportive shareholders <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I, you know, I think it's one you want to keep an eye on because it's in that sweet spot where it's the first drill program and if yeah. all it takes is one good hole in the first drill program. And they're testing co almost three different targets that are all potentially yeah. part of the same system, but it's a big potential area that they're probing even yeah, in this I first mean, program yeah what mike laid out to me was and he's the, the, they've got a really good there's a really good guy running the drill program who's he's a guy that actually worked for gold quest for several years so he Just really knows the rocks yeah. and he mike and, and callum have been bouncing this thing back and forth for mike callum's been down there for a month and a half now uh interestingly one of the things that he mapped in that that no one really noticed before or saw there's not that much outcrop is there is actually a rhyolite dome in the northern part of it, of the of the trend, and rhyolite domes are associated with a lot of large gold deposits, mm -hmm. and a lot of high grade gold deposits, and it was a bit of a, a bit of a head scratcher that that was there. And I know, I know that shifted things a little bit. I know the couple of the holes. I think it's the last couple of holes, they're going to try up there because Callum seems to really he really likes this. And I think I believe I believe Mike Moore is going down there, mm -hmm. in a few days. And the, but you know Mike said we pretty much already decided. You know, Callum knows this area. If he wants to sh take a shot at this target, let's do it. And that's one of the upsides of a downturn is good people are available. Good people who have experience in your area yeah. who may not have been available a couple of years ago, they're there telling you what to what sniffs to follow up. Yeah, yeah for no, sure. It does help. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, thanks for chatting with me. Thanks for talking to me, Gwen. <laughs>